He may be the most influential person you never heard of. He grew up in grinding poverty and lived his adult life almost as an ascetic, with a deep fear that his possessions might end up owning him. As a fighter pilot in the Korean War, he scored no kills, and as his career progressed, he moved through the ranks slowly. He alienated many around him by advocating weapon systems that were small and nimble rather than big and strong. And when he died, he was more embraced by the Marines than by the Air Force. His status was so low with the Flyboys that only two Air Force officers attended his funeral. But he left behind a legacy of monumental proportions. Scholars of warfare see him as a peer of Sun Tzu and Clausewitz. And while his name remains barely known even in the military, this fighter pilot's theories form the foundation of America's present overwhelming military strength. He is John Boyd, and he is a legend of air power. John Boyd was born in Erie, Pennsylvania in 1927. At first, his family was secure in a time of economic insecurity, affluent in a working class town. Then John's father died. The funeral was on the boy's third birthday. And from that moment on, his family teetered on the brink of collapse. His mother tried to maintain the lifestyle she had had before. She was a, a very stout, uh, militaristic, almost stereotypical German uh, woman who was very authoritative and uh, very loud and very demanding. Boyd's mother baked cakes and sold programs at civic events to earn enough money to feed her children. And Boyd's hand-me-down clothing was so worn and mismatched that he was once sent home from school to change. His mother, at times like that, gave her son only cold comfort. She said that people would uh, pick on you, Boyd, because of your background and your culture and your poverty. But you have something they don't. You have strong principles and good moral values. So no matter what they say, you just keep on keeping on. You never give up and you never give in. And then in the end, you will prevail. The fatherless Boyd gravitated to the beaches of Lake Erie and fell under the influence of two men who helped shape his future resolve. One was swimming coach Art Weeble, became a kind of surrogate father to Boyd. The other was Frank Patinato, the head lifeguard at the beach, who watched over Boyd and kept him out of trouble. After the outbreak of World War II, Patinato hired Boyd to work at the beach, a position of some responsibility and high status among the youth of Erie. It was Boyd's first taste of success. And then when Boyd was 15 or 16, the fellow who started the Eckerd chain of drugstores uh, was from Erie and had an airplane and took Boyd for a ride. And after that, he was, he was hooked on airplanes and knew fairly early on that he, he was going to be a, a military pilot. In school, Boyd doodled airplanes like something out of science fiction. He covered notebooks and scrap paper with designs for swept wing aircraft, the likes of which wouldn't be seen for more than a decade. After graduating high school, Boyd enlisted in the Army, but missed World War II. He served with the occupation forces in Japan and showed a keen sense of fair play that did not endear him to the Army. A popular story about Boyd, which may or may not be true, is that he was so offended that officers lived in comfort while enlisted men slept in cold tents that he once tore down two aircraft hangars to use as firewood. And then when he was threatened with a court-martial, came back with some arcane collection of uh, uh, military law that put the uh, officers on the defensive, and he said that they let him go. I think the story is more revealing of Boyd if it's not true than it would be if it were true, because it, it reveals what was to be a, um, a light motif, if you will, uh, throughout his life. That is, he, a man of great principle and high morals and enormous integrity, confronted uh, superior officers who were lacking in all these qualities. 
After a year, Boyd returned home. He attended the University of Iowa, where he enlisted in the Air Force ROTC, and took a flight aptitude test to see if he could get into pilot training. The results showed that he had an IQ of only 90. Boyd said that all of his life, that gave him a great advantage. If people thought, this guy doesn't even have a triple-digit IQ. He's a dummy. And he was underestimated all his life, and he loved that. And he said it gave him an extraordinary advantage in confrontations with the bureaucracy. He promised his girlfriend and future wife, Mary, that someday he would be a fighter pilot despite the low test scores. And after leaving Iowa in 1952, he attended pilot training at Williams Air Force Base in Arizona. There, the Air Force took stock of his talents and directed him to bomber training. Boyd, however, refused the assignment. He had, after all, promised his future wife that he would be a fighter pilot, and he had no interest in the flight by committee that is bomber aviation. He eventually convinced his commanding officer to give him a chance in fighters and ended up flying an F-86, the hottest American fighter of its time. Small, agile, with a snub nose and swept back wings, the Sabre resembled the futuristic aircraft that Boyd had doodled back in high school. Assigned to the 51st Fighter Wing in Korea in 1953, Boyd flew 22 combat missions without recording even a single kill. The war ended and Boyd stayed behind as tactics officer for his squadron. He took the job seriously showing no respect for the gallant traditions of aerial combat. He distilled what had been a gentlemanly art down to a bare handful of basic aerial maneuvers. And as he identified those maneuvers, he also identified as well counter maneuvers that could be used to thwart an attacker. By the time he left Korea for the fighter weapons school at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, He'd grown convinced of the inadequacy of the Air Force's fighter pilot training. He arrived in Nevada, a combat veteran with no kills, ready to show the experts how to do things right. The Army Air Force opened the Fighter Weapons School in 1949. And before John Boyd's arrival at Nellis Air Force Base, the school had changed little. Pilots spent their days practicing air-to-ground gunnery and taking air-to-air pot shots at slow, towed targets. They got almost no classroom instruction in tactical theory, and what they learned, they learned by doing. Boyd arrived at Nellis convinced that he had a better way of flying than the way the Air Force was teaching. While the instructors at Nellis tolerated his opinions, as a student he had little chance to implement his beliefs. His abilities in the air, however, were impressive. He excelled as a pilot and was asked to stay on as an instructor after he graduated. That gave him the opportunity he'd been waiting for. He was the first man ever to codify the art of air-to-air -air combat. Before John Boyd, it was a loosely collected uh, set of intangible rules. It had sort of been tricks, if you will, that had been handed down from World War I to World War II to Korea. And it was thought that this was such an arcane art that no one could ever master it. Boyd de-emphasized shooting at targets and spent more and more time with his students in the classroom. He taught them the basic maneuvers of combat, always with an emphasis on quick changes in speed and direction. To prove his point, he issued a standing challenge to fighter pilots everywhere. He bet that he could let an adversary get on his tail and within 40 seconds reverse their positions. If anyone could outmaneuver him, he'd pay them $40. Cocky even by the swaggering standards of fighter pilots, Boyd's challenge reeked of arrogance. He never lost a bet. He was an excellent pilot, and that's where you got into the dichotomy of a very swaggering, bold fighter pilot mentality and approach, which was complemented by this analytical and observational ability. What he was proving in those dogfights was not just that he was a hot pilot, however. In a way, he was also proving that the assumptions under which the Air Force had been operating were wrong. With every dogfight, 
He demonstrated that the decisive factors in air combat were not speed, firepower, and range, but the ability to change speed and direction quickly and dramatically. And that didn't set very well with an Air Force committed to the development of a generation of big, fast interceptors that could, at high speeds, barely turn at all. In 1960, Boyd finished the Aerial Attack Study, an encyclopedia of fighter tactics, beginning with the first biplanes and ending with the most current interceptors. He documented moves and counter moves, the evolution of both technology and tactics. It was a monumental work, and the Air Force immediately classified it. It took considerable editing and the removal of a variety of charts and graphs before the government allowed it to be published. Boyd left Nellis in 1961, bound for Georgia Tech University. There, he studied industrial engineering and began to formulate his energy maneuverability theory, a means of quantifying the combat performance of different aircraft. After graduation, he was sent to Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, where he worked with another engineer, Tom Christie, on the development of the EM theory. Energy maneuverability could tell a fighter pilot everything he needed to know in air-to-air -air combat. A pilot wants to know, if I'm at 30,000 feet, 500 knots, bending it into six Gs, what energy will I have when I come out of that turn? How much energy will my adversary have? If he stays on my back, will I have the energy to reverse the turn and get back into him and make him the defender? By understanding the energy retention characteristics of different aircraft, pilots can more precisely calculate what maneuver possibilities remain for both aircraft in a dogfight. EM theory changed the way pilots thought about air combat. It also strongly implied changes in aircraft design and tactics, and many in Air Force leadership had vested interests in the status quo. He was against the institution of the Air Force, against the dogma on which the Air Force is founded. Uh, he said most generals never do anything but get promoted. He thought there was an inverse relationship between the number of stars on a man's shoulder and his intelligence. He became known around Eglin as the Mad Major. His analysis of different fighters showed that the new generation of American aircraft were considerably less capable than their Soviet counterparts. He found himself surrounded by adversaries, a situation in which he seemed to thrive and isolated from the inside career track, he buried himself in research. He adopted a lifestyle so spartan that it approximated the poverty of his youth. My father, you know, lived that way on purpose because he wanted to be able to be free to do what he chose, and they couldn't take anything if you didn't have anything. In 1965, Boyd won the Air Force Systems Command Scientific Achievement Award for his work on energy maneuverability theory. A year later, he volunteered for service in Vietnam, but the Air Force instead sent him to the Pentagon to take over development of a troubled fighter then known as the FX. The FX assignment was not exactly a reward. The program was already in trouble, and with every iteration, the plane seemed to get bigger, heavier, and less maneuverable. But the assignment was also a tacit acknowledgement of Boyd's contribution. Clearly, for all the problems the Air Force had with Boyd's outspoken dissent, there were at least some high up in the Pentagon who had come to believe what Boyd believed, that the future of warfare would depend on speed and agility, not brute strength. When John Boyd arrived in the Pentagon in 1966, the Air Force bureaucracy was in a kind of crisis. In Vietnam, Air Force pilots mounted up and went into battle aboard F-4 Phantoms, heavy fighters originally designed for the Navy. The Air Force brass hated flying Navy jets and denigrated the F-4 as a saltwater airplane. To solve the problem, they had thrown all of their financial, political, and even emotional resources into the development of a replacement. They were developing something called the FX, which was really an updated model of the F-111, one of the most scandal-plagued, horrible airplanes the Air Force has ever developed. And they have this bigger, higher, faster, farther mindset. 
The Air Force handed Boy the FX and said basically, fix it. Boyd's reply was that it couldn't be fixed, except that he expressed his disdain for the work of the previous team in typically insulting terms. Boyd told the Air Force that he had never designed a plane before, but that he could do a better job screwing up than the Air Force did working hard. The Air Force, confronted with either the failure of the FX program and the acceptance of the next generation of hand-me-down fighters from the Navy, or putting up with Boyd, reluctantly chose to put up with Boyd. And there was a lot to put up with. Uh, he could call them up at 3 a.m. and discuss some of the most arcane ideas they had ever heard of. And he didn't really want a conversation. He just wanted to talk because Boyd learned by talking, by exploring different ideas. And these people oftentimes never said anything but hello. And Boyd would talk for an hour or so, and then he would thank them for helping him and hang up. Boyd took the 80,000-pound F-111 clone and whittled it down until it became the F-15. He saved the program and delivered the Air Force an aircraft it loved but he himself thought the F-15 a failure. He was so unhappy with what the Air Force did to the F-15. It's a great airplane, but it's nowhere near what it would have been had Boyd been given free reign. The F-15 was still too big and lumbering for Boyd. Too much a violation of the EM theory. It wasn't until his next project, the YF-16, that he got to create a plane from scratch that really exemplified his beliefs. Developed almost in secret, below the radar of the Pentagon brass who were busy congratulating themselves on the F-15, the YF-16 was lighter, accelerated more quickly, turned in a smaller radius, and featured a bubble cockpit that gave pilots unobstructed visibility in the sky. That visibility was crucial because of another theory on which Boyd had been working, the OODA loop. OODA is an acronym for observe, orient, decide, and act, and describes the basic decision-making process that pilots undergo in conflict. It was a formula for invading your adversary's space, having situational awareness of where you were at and what you were doing, but at the same time understanding your adversary's motivation. Pilots flying the F-16 and using the OODA loop experienced something referred to today as getting inside the decision cycle of the enemy. What that means in plain language is that a pilot who understands the basic tactics and responses of air combat as laid out by Boyd while at the fighter weapons school, who uses Boyd's OODA loop, and who is flying an aircraft designed according to Boyd's EM theory, can anticipate the maneuvers of enemy fighters. An enemy executing a maneuver in reaction to an attack finds himself subject to a second attack that perfectly anticipates his not yet completed evasive maneuver. It causes the adversary to become disoriented. Uh, uh, your moves are ambiguous. He doesn't know what's next. He becomes oriented to himself rather than to the external environment, and he begins to collapse. The Air Force didn't much care what Boyd did from that point on, and he closed out his service on loan to NASA, working on flight simulators. The Air Force bid him farewell and don't let the door hit you on the way out. Interestingly enough, however, Boyd found a more appreciative audience while giving a lecture to a group of Marine officers. After Vietnam, the Marines were, it's safe to say, in pretty bad shape. Senior leadership had retired, morale among officers was low, and it seemed to many almost as if the Marines had no relevant mission. Boyd published Patterns of Warfare, a detailed historical analysis of war and battle doctrine. A lecture he gave on his advocacy of high-speed warfare designed to disorient more than destroy made Boyd a kind of cult hero and found himself adopted by an unlikely group of soldiers. The Marine Corps has always been the most flexible and adaptable of all the services because they have to be. They're the smallest, and they live in fear of being suborned or, or overtaken by either the Army or the Navy. They loved John Boyd, and they knew he had the answer to, the, to their problems. 
The Marines saw Boyd's OODA loop as the key to an entirely new kind of ground warfare. They rebuilt their doctrine almost from scratch based on the OODA loop, using speed and information to get inside the enemy's ability to make decisions. Rechristened maneuver warfare, Boyd's doctrine became the basis of the rebuilt Marine Corps and to a lesser degree, the Army. Boyd, who had retired to Florida, had no idea how his ideas were permeating the military. He immersed himself in military history and for 15 years wrote tirelessly without really knowing whether he was having an impact or not. In 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. The initial battle plans for the liberation of the tiny Mideastern country landed on the desk of then Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney. Cheney had attended Boyd's lectures, met personally with him, and had a deep understanding of the meaning of Boyd's theories. He looked the plan over and rejected it because it failed to incorporate elements of maneuver warfare. And then the secretary did something interesting. He called John Boyd and asked him to come to Washington. And it was a great secrecy. Nobody knew Boyd was there. And it was Boyd who developed the, the philosophical underpinnings of what became the famous left hook, the Marine feint in Kuwait, the old bit. Everything about the swift and decisive nature of that conflict came from uh, John Boyd. Boyd, typically acerbic, dismissed General Norman Schwarzkopf's initial battle plan as high diddle diddle straight up the middle. The battle plan changed. The famous Hail Mary flanking of the Iraqi army was the first battlefield application of maneuver warfare, a pure manifestation of Boyd's theories. John Boyd died March 9, 1997. His funeral was attended by dozens of Marines, officials from the Department of Defense, and others who understood his contribution, but only two uniformed members of the Air Force. He remains to this day largely unknown even among those in the military. It's nice to know that you have people in your family that, you know, uh, do the right thing, work for things, you know, they're not compromising. And he, he changed things. I mean, there's not a lot of people who can say they've changed things. The F-4 Phantom II is a versatile tactical fighter. It can be used as a fighter bomber, interceptor, or as an air superiority fighter. To gain and maintain air superiority is in part the mission of the Tactical Air Command. F-4 pilots assign the specific mission of seeking out and destroying enemy aircraft in the air and on the ground must understand and be proficient in aerial combat maneuvering. Air-to-air -air combat is a swift and deadly game. Victory or defeat may be decided in only a few seconds. Mission success, and usually your life, depend upon a thorough knowledge of your weapons and weapon system, as well as those of the enemy. Pilots assigned combat duty will be exposed constantly to situations where only the most skillful maneuvering, teamwork, and timely application of basic air combat tactics will enable them to emerge victorious. Applying the F-4 in air combat tactics training, as well as in combat itself, demands an ability to maneuver the aircraft at maximum performance. To do this, the pilot must have an understanding of adverse yaw and dihedral effect. Adverse yaw is defined as yaw that is opposite to the desired direction of turn. At subsonic speeds and high angles of attack, rudder must be used in the F-4 to offset this yaw. This yawing moment is caused in part by the aileron on the top wing, left wing in a right turn, being deflected down and causing more drag than the spoilers on the low wing because the spoilers are operating in a lower pressure area. 
One example of dihedral effect, and perhaps the easiest to understand, is the characteristic of any swept wing aircraft to obtain more lift from a wing that is straightened out into the relative wind. The opposite wing is, in effect, swept further back. For this reason, the F-4 can be rolled with rudder. When performing a hard turn, as angle of attack begins to increase, the pilot may be tempted to tighten the turn by using more aileron. This adds to the undesirable condition, and if these improper controls are held, a snap roll away from the desired turn may result. This could be disastrous in combat. To prevent a snap roll or post stall gyration, the pilot must, when subsonic at high angles of attack, use rudder to control roll rate and bank, hold the ailerons neutral, and control turn rate with back stick pressure. Caution! Develop a feel for the rudders. Do not arbitrarily jam full rudder in the direction of turn, or dihedral effect will cause a roll in the direction of applied rudder. With proper training, the F-4 pilot will have no trouble in developing a feel for his aircraft and flying it to maximum performance. Remember, you are flying the airplane, not riding it. The basic fighting unit is the two-ship element. It is much more maneuverable than a flight of four. The leader must, however, spend a great deal of his time clearing the wingman rather than looking for potential targets. When the element is used as a part of a flight of four, the wingman flies a position 1,000 to 3,000 feet out from the lead, depending on altitude and from line abreast to 20 degrees back. Flying this position, the wingman can cover the leader's 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock area through the rear hemisphere, his primary area of responsibility. During turns, the wingman maneuvers in the horizontal and vertical planes. By playing the outside as well as the inside of the turn, the wingman can easily maintain position, conserve energy, and provide visual coverage in the rear hemisphere. When on patrol, the wingman stays well forward in easy view of the leader. He maintains coverage in the rear hemisphere while the leader searches for the enemy. The distance between aircraft may be increased at higher altitudes due to increased enemy missile performance. This increased separation extends visual coverage in the rear hemisphere, moving the blind spot farther out. Upon initial contact with the enemy, the wingman must move to the maximum performance maneuvering envelope. The size and shape of this envelope varies, but generally, it is a cone 60 degrees to 90 degrees from the leader and 1,000 to 1,500 feet back. These distances and angles may vary as long as the wingman is able to provide mutual support and visual coverage during violent maneuvers. The primary duty of the wingman while flying in the maximum performance maneuvering envelope is to provide coverage in the rear. To maintain position and to perform his duties, the wingman will need a degree of skill and proficiency which is gained only through practice. When flying in the maximum performance maneuvering envelope, the wingman provides the leader with a spare weapon system should his own malfunction. My gun's jammed. Take him, two. Should this occur, the wingman moves forward, assumes the lead, and maintains whatever advantage the leader may have had.
If at any time the wingman cannot perform his duties, he should notify his leader immediately. The offensive potential of the two-ship flight is greatly enhanced when it is used as part of the basic combat patrol formation. This is a four-ship flight comprised of two mutually supporting elements. In this formation, the leader plans the attack and engages the enemy. The number three man, or element leader, supports the flight leader and assists in the attack. The number two and four men support their respective leaders and cover the vulnerable six o'clock areas. Since the element leader functions as alternate flight leader as well as leader of his own element, he is selected for his demonstrated leadership, ability, and aggressiveness. The supporting element is flown three to 9,000 feet out from the leader and zero to 5,000 feet up. These distances will depend upon altitude, configuration, and mission requirements. This is because of decreased enemy missile performance in denser air, and the difficulty in seeing camouflaged aircraft at low altitudes. Visual contact must be maintained. While on patrol, the element leader may maneuver his element from a position of line abreast to a maximum of 10 degrees back. During turns, the element maintains this position by energy altitude trade-offs. Generally, this type of maneuvering will require one crossover for every 90 degrees of turn. The leader will usually turn 90 degrees or in 90 degree increments. If not, he'll inform the element leader so that he may plan his crossover so as to be in correct formation position when the leader rolls out. There are two points that deserve special emphasis. First, wherever possible, the supporting element is flown down sun. Second, Great care must be taken when crossing over in the fluid four formation to prevent mid-air collision during the brief periods of reduced visual contact. Correct employment of visual search techniques by each member of the flight will provide good detection rates at ranges of three miles or more in the rear hemisphere. The flight leader searches the forward hemisphere from 15 degrees above the horizon downward. The lead also makes casual checks of his element and its rear area. The element leader, in addition to maintaining his position, searches the forward hemisphere from 10 degrees below the horizon upward. The right wing man searches the area from the flight leader's nine o'clock position to the rear as far as he can see. The left wingman searches the area from the support leader's three o'clock position to his rear as far as he can see. The use of small check turns will improve the six o'clock coverage by displacing the blind spot from side to side. Laxity in performing scan responsibilities cannot be tolerated. This is equally true in regard to radar search. Radar coverage in a flight of four is improved when each flight member searches a definite area with a minimum overlap. The lead aircraft selects one bar scan, radar mode, 50 mile scope, and adjusts the antenna elevation so that approximately half inch ground return appears at the top of the scope. This radar search pattern supplements the leader's visual search area. The rear seat pilot maintains constant radar surveillance of his area. The number three man or supporting element lead selects three bar scan, radar mode, 50 mile scope, and adjusts the antenna to obtain half inch of ground return on the lowest sweep. He then selects a one bar scan, 
thus automatically raising the antenna to the desired elevation. This radar search pattern supplements the element lead's visual search area. The number three rear seat pilot, like the lead rear seat pilot, concentrates exclusively on radar scan. The number two man selects one bar scan, radar mode, 25 mile scope, and adjusts the antenna so that half inch of ground return appears at the top of the scope and maintains that search position. While the number two aircraft commander is scanning his visual search area, the rear seat pilot divides his time evenly between the radar and a visual scan of the same area scanned by his aircraft commander. The number four man selects one bar scan, radar mode, 50 mile scope, and adjusts the elevation strobe to eight degrees up. He then selects three bar scan for search. The rear seat pilot in the number four aircraft, like the number two rear seat pilot, divides his time evenly between visual scan and radar scan. The number four aircraft radar scan area combined with the number two radar scan area provides a thorough long range detection capability in the forward hemisphere when combined with the visual and radar scan of the lead and supporting element. It can be said that the air battle consists of three phases acquisition, maneuvering, and terminal. Acquisition, you must find the enemy to engage him. Maneuvering, you must outmaneuver the enemy to destroy him. Terminal, you must know your weapons and weapon system to hit him. The F-4 has an excellent long-range air intercept radar. If properly used, this radar can be a decisive factor in the air battle. With this long-range detection capability, it is probable that contact will occur in the forward quadrant prior to visual contact. The problem of visual identification of bogies must receive special attention. Proper interpretation of radar returns can provide valuable information at sufficient range and time to allow the attackers to maneuver to gain tactical advantage prior to visual contact. When equipped with all aspect missiles and in a front hemisphere attack, separate the elements to achieve a first pass ID and missile launch. A good rule of thumb to determine minimum contact range necessary to gain the separation for attack is approximately three times optimum missile range. For example, if optimum missile range is five miles, then minimum contact range is 15 miles. If contact is made at sufficient range, the ID element should make a descending acceleration using afterburner to 1.2 Mach. The launch element executes a barrel roll or S maneuver to obtain desired separation in minimum time. While gaining separation, the ID element wingman should make a thorough radar search of the area for other aircraft that could be a threat. The ID element lead maintains radar contact and maneuvers for a collision course. After allowing the ID element to gain the desired separation, the launch element also accelerates to 1.2 Mach and maintains a target lock-on while keeping visual contact with the ID element. As soon as visual ID can be made, the ID element lead relays to the launch element lead the identification of the target aircraft and, if it is enemy, clears him to fire. Mix, mix, 21s. No missiles on board. Clear to fire, clear to fire. If the ID element is undetected passing below the enemy, 
or if the enemy fails to maneuver, the ID element should employ basic fighter maneuvers to re-attack or support the launch element. If, however, the ID element is detected and the enemy maneuvers against it, they may employ counter maneuvers against the enemy or continue a straight ahead run out while the friendly launch element sandwiches the enemy. When the ID is made and clearance to fire received, the launch element executes either a front or a rear hemisphere attack, depending on the enemy's actions. Both elements then engage the enemy, supporting each other until the enemy is destroyed. When attacking from a beam, the separation required is less, and it is easier to attain. On the initial visual identification pass, the ID element may fire if identification can be made soon enough. If not, he turns 180 degrees from the target's heading and maneuvers for a follow-up attack. The turn will put him out of the target area and allow the launch element a shot as they follow and maneuver for a missile or a gun attack. The two elements then fight as a team until the enemy is destroyed. In a stern attack, you must consider the range to target, fuel required to close, and your heading. A stern chase is useless if bingo will occur before identification or firing range. A stern approach, however, is the best position for surprise in a missile or gun attack. The elements in a stern attack maneuver so as to keep pressure on the enemy at all times and support each other until the enemy is destroyed. When operating as a lone element and attacking a flight of four, make either a beam attack or a stern attack, since identification and re-attack are the most difficult from head on. Be very careful to maintain element integrity when attacking as a lone element, since look back from the F4 is poor. After radar acquisition and initial attack, competence in basic fighter maneuvers is essential in destroying the enemy with either a missile or gun. The high-speed yo-yo is a good maneuver to maintain the advantage when on the attack. Its purpose is to maintain nose-tail separation. As you recognize an overshoot coming up, keep your G's on while reducing some of your bank. Slide high and inside the defender's turn. This will reduce your forward velocity while maintaining nose-tail separation. Watch your opponent and slide back down on the attack. Don't get the nose too low or you may be forced out the bottom. The low-speed yo-yo is another good attack maneuver in the F-4. Lower the nose and establish your cutoff while nose low. Light the afterburner and accelerate to Mach 1.1 or more. Terminate afterburner and begin pull-up. When the nose is above the horizon, relight afterburner and slide up toward the defender's 6 o'clock. As you slide into your opponent's lethal cone, be prepared to perform a follow-up high-speed yo-yo. The barrel roll attack is an excellent offensive maneuver for a missile or gun attack. When the defender is turning into you while you are still at long range, 8,000 feet or more, and generating angle off 40 degrees or more, Begin the maneuver from low and inside the defender's turn. Play the rate of roll for the desired effect, depending on the range and rate of the defender's turn. 
If the defender is turning right, you roll to the left, and vice versa. Back stick and rudder is used throughout the entire maneuver to hold the nose in the desired position. Upon completion of the roll, you will find your angle off diminished and the range reduced. If G-load permits, fire a missile when in range. Press the attack and if need be, execute another barrel roll attack or perform a high-speed yo-yo. While the fighter pilot and his aircraft comprise an offensive weapon, the possibility is strong that the first contact with the enemy will be in the rear hemisphere. This is due in part to the enemy's GCI capability. Thus, it is imperative that you have a thorough knowledge of both offensive and defensive maneuvers. The basic defensive maneuver is the defensive turn. This is a hard turn performed to prevent an opponent from achieving a launch or firing position. With this maneuver, the defender can diminish the lethal envelope and improve his position by rotating his cone of vulnerability away from the attacker. If the attack is discovered closer in, a break may be necessary. This is a maximum performance turn into the attack to destroy the enemy's tracking solution and force him to overshoot. The effect is gained in the first 45 to 60 degrees of turn. If the attacker does not yo-yo and overshoots, reverse and if you're lined up, Take a quick shot at him. If you are not lined up, get him out of phase and dive for separation. If an attacker has been forced to overshoot, another maneuver is the scissors. As the MiG overshoots, make a nose-high reversal and continue with a series of turn reversals. This will rotate your lethal cone away from the attacker and force him again to cross your flight path and eventually to your 12 o'clock position. The scissors is an effort to gain an offensive position. The advantage, however, lies with the aircraft having the shorter turn radius and the lower airspeed. For this reason, the scissors is not considered a good maneuver against the lighter, more maneuverable MiG series aircraft. After the first couple of reversals, if you cannot get a shot, watch the MiG. Get him out of phase with you, and when he cannot see you, roll rapidly. Engage the afterburner, pull the nose down to vertical, and accelerate out. Bear in mind, you need altitude for this. Should the MiG follow close in, you may set the hook. As he commits himself nose low, reduce power, extend speed brakes, and pull up at maximum performance. This should throw the MiG out the bottom. Roll off and drop in on him. If the MiG does not follow close in, do not set the hook. Accelerate out to at least Mach 1.1, descend to low altitude, and gain separation. A moderate 2G roll while descending should be enough to spoil the MiG's tracking solution on the way down. When on the deck, make random reversals to keep him from getting a tracking solution, while you use the F-4's advantage of speed at low altitude to outdistance the enemy. When out of gun range, stay low if you're still within missile range. When you are definitely clear of the MiG, then pull up and re-engage head-on. When a flight of four F-4s is attacked by two MiGs, the element under attack should separate either by a straight-ahead diving acceleration or by a turnaway from the free element. The free element then quickly sandwiches the attackers. Again, be doubly watchful for additional MiGs in the area.
If both friendly elements are under attack, it may be necessary to fight as lone elements until one element destroys his opponent and is thus free to assist the other element. When defending as a lone element, the defensive split is a valuable maneuver to use instead of the last ditch maneuver. With the MiGs approaching gun range, for example, 4,000 feet out, and remember, that is 4,000 feet out from the wingman, and you are unable to force him out of your lethal cone, call for a split. The low man continues his hard turn into the attack, while the high man slides high, gaining separation on the low man. The attackers are then forced to make a choice. Take the low man. Take the high man. Split. Fake at the low man. And then take the high man. Or perform the fluid separation. An analysis of past engagements reveals that the MiGs are unlikely to fake or perform a fluid separation. The defenders must be on the alert. If the attackers split, each defender then defends himself and fights alone until he's destroyed his opponent before he can assist the other friendly aircraft. If the attackers take the low man, he continues the hard turn and goes into a diving spiral to gain separation while the high man zooms up, then drops down to sandwich the attackers once they're line abreast. Should the attackers take the high man, he performs a moderate G roll under, ending in a turn away from the low man. The low man then pulls up and sandwiches the attacker as quickly as possible. It becomes readily apparent that teamwork and radio discipline are mandatory for the defensive split. Proficiency in fluid four and air combat tactics comes exclusively from training and practice. This proficiency is the only key to success. Air combat is a deadly game played for the highest stakes in the world. Your life and the life of your buddy. With so much to lose, there is no room for error. The knowledge gained in that aggressive air combat tactics program, combined with the skills developed in air-to-air -air gunnery training, will provide the tactical fighter pilot the tools necessary to engage and destroy the enemy in the fight for the sky. Good luck and good hunting. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.